straight off the back, very strong start, 80 points in the green, 18,600 in the nifty, we're up close to about 90 points. Markets, they are above that 18,600 mark. I think initially, right after markets opened, there was perhaps a little bit of pullback, but after that, uh, things have just kind of moved around, moved along. Uh, the Nifty for, its, for what it's worth has still managed a 60-point gain, so that's not bad. Mid-cap index almost flattening out as we are closing up and the Bank Nifty also uh, paring down its gains. The Bank Nifty was up almost 7 tenths of a percent at one point in time. But final tally is more close to the 150-point up move. Hello and welcome to Markets Today, the show where we track about six hours of the day's trading action and five headlines. I'm Reema Tindulkar. And these are the headlines for the day. A positive start to the week on the Lal Street. The mid-cap index rises for the 11th straight day, ending at a record high. Tata Chemicals perks up on Tata Group's plan to invest 13,000 crore rupees in lithium-ion battery unit in Gujarat. While this will provide battery supplies for Tata Motors EV range, Tata Chemicals could supply inputs for production. The management tells CNBC TV 18 that US and India will contribute to a large part of the growth. HUL slumps a percent. CFO Ritesh Tiwari says commodity prices tapering off and price cuts in soaps, detergents and shampoos will lead to a volume-led growth from the second half of the fiscal. Says that overall the slowdown has bottomed out, highlights substantial demand recovery in rural India. An underperformed call by McQuarrie weighs down on InfoEdge. It expects a sharp downside and slower growth in the Nokri business. Pre-call gains after its promoters upstake. Mindacorp falls as it eyes a fundraise likely to up its bid. Crude oil prices rise after Saudi Arabia announces a voluntary production cut by a million barrels per day from July. The move comes after OPEC nations made no changes to the planned oil production on Sunday. And here's the lineup of what we have for you in store today. It's a packed show. In market opinion, we've got Manish Santalia, Motilal Oswal Asset Management. In big corporate voices, we've got R. Mukandar of Tata Chemicals and Ritesh Tiwari, CFO HUL. Let's start with the day's market action. The Sensex gained to 40 points. The Nifty up 60 points, despite some profit booking in late trade. The Nifty is now closer to 18,600. The mid-cap index gained for the 11th straight day and ended at record high levels. The Nifty Bank, too, managed to gain in trade, closing with a gain of 160 points, up 0.4%. Prashant is here with a wrap of the day's action. Well, it was a perfect and strong start in the morning uh, this Monday, but things uh, worsened, and worsened especially starting 1 o'clock, 1.30 p.m. And in the last 40, 50 minutes of trade, the sell-off was a little more dramatic, we ended higher on the Nifty by about 60 points, but uh, it could have been a 100 and 120 point uh, gain, which was not the case. Banks also sold off a little bit. Small caps and mid caps uh, ending higher. Mid caps were flat. Small caps uh, also came off in the last 30 minutes of trade, but uh, ended in the green. Small cap index last week was the big outperformer. The index was up 3%. Uh, now, large caps, uh, big gains coming through in uh, stocks like Mahindra, Axis, Tata Motors and Reliance Industries. Actually, banks and Reliance were the big reason why the Nifty did what it did. Uh, in the broader markets, this is where the action is and momentum showing up in different places. Shipbuilders, uh, for one, Mazgaon Dock, Cochin Shipyard, Garden Reach Shipbuilders, looking very good. Uh, defense names, Paras Defense, Valchand Nagar, continuing the move that we've seen last week. Angel One, HBL Power, Pirimal Pharma, Nava, which is erstwhile Navabharat Ventures, Markson's Pharma, the textile maker, Indocount, Talbros Auto, out of the blue, huge volumes, big move. Car Trade, E-Clerks, Traxon were some of the other movers that we had. Some losses as well, much shorter list. InfoH, which is Nokri, Scient was lower, Inox Win, Gujarat, Floro and Keynes uh, saw some profit booking today. Uh, the Nifty is struggling to break out of this uh, 18,500, 18,600 range, conclusively at least. While broader markets have no such problem, they're continuing to rally, as you can see today. U.S., will the rally broaden is the question. On Friday, we saw the first hints of that. Will we, uh, you know, see a continuation of that, which makes the rally there much more broader, I think is the important question from the global market perspective. Back to you. Thank you for that. In market opinion, Manish Sontalia of Motilal Oswal Asset Management believes the market will mirror the earnings growth trajectory. Broadly, markets are going to project what earnings are going to do. And I think uh, for the year ended, FI23, we ended with 807. 
that is 11% sort of a nifty earnings growth and for next year it is going to be uh 15% growth another 15% growth so from that point of view i think uh, you know there is a fair valuation on the markets markets may consolidate a while uh, around these levels uh notwithstanding the fact that everybody is bullish on india Let's get to the second headline then for the day. Tata Group and Tata Chemicals surged in trade. Tata Group is all set to foray into EV battery manufacturing. The group subsidiary, Agritas Energy Storage Solutions, has signed an MOU with Gujarat government to set up a giga factory for the manufacturing of lithium-ion cells. The project entails an estimated initial investment of 13,000 crore rupees. Sonal joins in for more. Thank you so much for that. Well, first, the news, of course, that Data Group has signed $1.6 billion of electric vehicle battery power plant deal. And this will, be, this will be done by one of the subsidiary of the groups. And they have committed this capex via the subsidiary. They will be setting up a 20 gigawatt hour of lithium ion cell manufacturing unit in Gujarat. The initial capacity is that, of course, so, uh, which will be doubled in the second phase of expansion as per the filing. Uh, the time frame for ramp up and technology tie ups is not yet known, but of course, it could benefit. Uh, Tata Motors because that is a big push that the company is uh, focusing on as well. Additionally, Tata Chemicals will also be in focus because remember it makes chemicals which are used in lithium carbonate uh, batteries and that ultimately goes into the EV ecosystem. Every one ton of lithium carbonate which is used in EVs requires about two tons of soda ash which is the main product of the company. Uh, company uh, uh, we spoke to the company earlier today, they did tell us that they are the second derivative suppliers to EV battery manufacturers. They are already in deals and in agreements with lithium carbon manufacturers across the world and this will only add to that particular um, uh, particular agreement. However, they did not commit to whether they will be supplying this extra soda ash that is required for Tata Group's plants as well and large part of their supply goes to the automobile segment. Centrum says that 500 tons of lithium carbonate is required for 1 gigawatt hour battery. So for 20 gigawatt hour, it will require around 20,000 tons of soda ash. Uh, a company is going to, uh, in the expansion phase. They will be expanding their soda ash capacity, which will be around 1.3 million metric tons post the expansion. So 20,000 tons would just be 1.5% of their total capacity. Uh, they will not be needing anything more. So while they did not commit to it, looks like they'll get additional volumes because of this deal. And that's why the street is excited. Uh, the company which has signed the MOU with uh, the Gujarat government is Agarthas Energy uh, System Solutions uh, Limited. It is a Tata Group company. Uh, certainly to the extent that if there is any opportunities there, we will examine it on its merits and they would also examine their supply base on their merits. I think that goes without saying. We have uh, contracts with the uh, lithium carbonate suppliers uh, in South America and other parts of the world. So they, they do feed into the supply chain. So we, we are today probably tier three, not even tier two, uh, which means we are not uh, the suppliers to the battery manufacturer, but we are suppliers to suppliers of battery manufacturer. That's where we are. And uh, if any opportunity does arise, we will uh, certainly uh, 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 work towards that. In terms of the growth itself, if you look at uh, our investment, uh, we are adding up the 200,000 tons of capacity in India is getting commissioned. Additional 300,000 ton is in the process of uh, design. So uh, half a million ton will be within India. About 100,000 will be in Kenya and another 400,000 tons in the US. So all in all, work is ongoing in terms of a million ton additional capacity. Overall, uh, we do believe a capex, ongoing capex of about uh, 2,000 odd crores. Uh, uh, of which, uh, uh, let's say, 500 to 600 would be the sustenance capex and about 1,500 crores would be about the uh, growth capex. And this may vary from year to year, depending on which year it uh, peaks. I'm taking an average. I think this is an ongoing effort. And uh, uh, and, and so, some of it would also play into new products like silica, which goes into tires. And these are tire products, which uh, will be for uh, uh, green tires. Okay, let's get now to the third headline for the day. And this is a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Hindustan Unilever CFO Ritesh Tiwari expects volumes to drive growth in the second half of this fiscal. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, he also went on to say that the company has cut the prices of soaps, detergents and shampoos as commodity prices have begun to ease. Shilpa is standing by with the key highlights from that conversation. Shilpa. Well, the growth slowdown in the FMCG industry, especially in rural, is now bottoming up. 
about bottoming out. Now, that's the word that's coming in from HOL CFO Ritesh Savari, and he attributes this mainly to commodity prices and overall inflation cooling off. And therefore, volumes will start leading growth now from the second half of this fiscal. For FMCG business overall market, long period, look at last five years, 10 years, 20 years, growth typically comes two third from volume mm -hmm. and one third from price. Yeah. Given the amount of inflation that we've seen for last one and a half to two years time, growth has been led by pricing. What will change going forward as commodities are tapering off? We are seeing sequential declines as well in many large commodities. Price will taper off and going forward, the growth will be volume led. Within the flat volume, urban is growing by 3%, rural is still declining by 3%. Now, remember, for the past six quarters, volumes have actually been on a declining trend. And the FMCG growth came from price increases. But this price growth component will now start tapering off, HOL said. And now the direct benefit here for consumers is that HOL has taken price cuts and in some cases increased grammage in its soaps, detergents and shampoos. And consumers will start seeing reduced prices in the months to follow. But the reason why volume recovery will actually take another two quarters at least is because the benefit of lower inflation and therefore price cuts takes some time to reach consumers. Large part of price cut, I would say we have started invoicing, we have put in the market, oh. but as I mentioned, it's always a trade pipeline. Mm. By the time consumers experience that, it takes few more months. Correct. So we have done large part of the price decreases because commodities have come off, but consumers should take, in my view, a few more months for them to fully experience the price cuts that we have done. Now, another important takeaway from the interview is that apart from health and well-being, which is a category that it recently forayed into, HOL is now eyeing the Mastige beauty segment for acquisitions. Now, this is a segment that sits just above the premium. So that's about a 250 price point, and that's where acquisitions are going to, most probably, HOL will be eyeing for acquisitions. Back to you. Shilpa, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we'll slip into a very short break on that note. We'll come back with more. CNG is good, but to get something, you have to give up something. OM! Just cut the crap, man. The surprisingly spacious MG Comet EV. The no nonsense car. Welcome back. You're watching Markets Today. Now let's go over through the rest of the headlines that we're tracking for you. And this is headline number four. And these are a variety of stocks that were in news. So let me start with InfoEdge. Info now, InfoEdge declined close to about 2% because Macquarie said they have an underperformed rating on the stock with a target price of 3,000 rupees. We're looking at a downside of more than 25% on the stock from current levels. They've also added InfoEdge uh, Info to Macquarie's Asia Marquee Cell list. Uh, now, the key reason for that is they see slower revenue growth in their recruitment business. So, Nokri's revenue growth was very strong over the last two or three years. And that's because IT hiring was strong. IT companies formed the bulk of their recruitment revenues and IT companies were hiring left, right and center. But now that has changed. Most of the IT companies are going slow on their hiring for the last two quarters. The headcount at many of the IT companies has been stagnant or even lower. So according to McQuarrie, this uh, slow hiring by IT companies will slow down the revenue growth of McQuarrie. When the revenue growth slows down, they expect margins to come under pressure, so margins too will decline. Secondly, they also see no clear path to profit in other verticals of the company like real estate and matrimony. And third, they appear to be a bit concerned about the write-off seen in their portfolio company. Remember, in this year, the company has written off close to about two hundred and uh, sorry, $75 million uh, worth of investment in uh, names like 4B Networks as well as Bizcrum uh, Infotech. So McQuarrie is a bit concerned about that. Uh, so that's about InfoEdge. By the close of trade, the stock was down close to about 3%. There was another mid-cap on a spotlight, and that's pre-call. That soared 2% after promoters bought 1.4% stake in the company. Pre-call engineering bought 15 lakh shares, and pre-call logistics bought 1.8 lakh shares. Meanwhile, Minda Corp fell about a percent after the board approved a fundraise plan of up to 600 crore rupees. 
The fundraising will take place through public or private offering. Moving on, the center has banned 14 fixed dose combination drugs, including those which are used for treating common infections like cough and fever. The government has said that there was no therapeutic justification for the medicines, added that they may evolve, involve risks. Ekta joins in. Ekta, we learned that the banned list includes some popular cough syrup combinations as well. Take us through the financial impact of this ban. Thanks for that. Well, some popular cough syrups have been pulled off the shelves after the government banned 14 fixed-dose drug combinations over the weekend. In a move which was in the making for the past few months, the government, citing lack of therapeutic rationale, banned mainly medicines used to treat coughs, colds and respiratory infections. They clamped down mainly on cough syrups, banning at least 10 combinations available in the market, including all those that contain codeine, which is an opioid pain reliever. Before we move ahead, what exactly is a fixed dose combination or FTC? An FTC combines more than one drug in a single pill or syrup. India is one of the few countries that allows fixed dose combinations. While the advantage of fixed dose combinations is that it is easier to administer and makes the medicines more affordable, there can be irrational combinations. Hence, the combination drugs can not only result in misuse, especially say for codeine-based medicines, which have narcotic properties, but also build resistance to certain molecules present in the drug. Now, according to industry sources, a total of around 500 crores worth of products have been impacted. Companies such as Abbott, which is the private arm, and Mankind have seen a significant impact. For example, Abbott's Fencidil Cough Linktis is an important brand for the company, is expected to be under the scanner. Mankind's Cody Star, which is expected to be around 140 crores in terms of a brand size with 25% market share, and pediatric syrup Teddy Cough are expected to be impacted as well. Glenmark's Ascaril C, generating 19 to 20 crores of sales annually, is also expected to be under the scanner. Now, Sipla has indicated that brands Cough Dex Syrup, Cough Dex Plus Syrup, and Cough Tin Syrup are under the ban, while Dr. Reddy's has indicated none of the ZX brands are under the scanner and have not been promoting Dialex DC, which is on the list. The reason the impact might be limited is because the government banned 344 fixed-dose combinations in March 2016. Companies then became wary of fixed-dose combinations. More so, they were aware of the government's thinking on the FTCs in question Hence, not only changed combinations in time, but stopped marketing drugs that could have been impacted. Lastly, pediatricians have welcomed the move as they believe, while many of these combination drugs, though have been used for years, saw sudden spurt in usage for children during and post-COVID-19, with many of them available over-the-counter or easily accessible even without a prescription. Ekta, thank you very much for that. Let's get to the fifth and the final headline. Crude oil prices are on the rise. This is after Saudi Arabia announced voluntary production cuts from July. The decision comes after an OPEC meeting on Sunday where all nations agreed to make no change to the plan oil production. Manisha is here with more on Saudi Arabia's decision and how it will impact oil prices. Manisha. It's been a strong day for the crude oil prices and that has been on the back of a very strong OPEC and allies meeting. Remember, it started two hours late. It went on for seven hours and there was a lot of quota discussion that we saw happen here. But the major lead clearly came in from Saudi Arabia, which has pledged additional cuts going forward. So what Saudi Arabia has done is that it has taken a lion's share Half a million barrels per day is what they're going to continue to cut until the end of next year as well. And one million barrels per day of a total cut is what they will do in July. Now, this is a month which is strong in sense of summer driving demand in sense of US. And this is a month that actually could be looking at a deficit as well. So from nearly 10 million barrels per day of an output in the month of May, the Saudi Arabia now will be producing 9 million barrels per day in the month of July. So July is seen as a bullish month by various uh, investors and banks and this is a month that you could see could be looking at support as well 
Coming to OPEC and allies, well, they had cut 2 million barrels per day in the month of October and they added 1.66 million barrels per day in the month of April. So currently, OPEC and allies are cutting 3.66 million barrels per day every day in the month of May until December 2023. What they will also do is that they will add another output cut of 1.4 million barrels per day from January 2024. Now, this is exactly what the markets are reading into. If this cuts continue on, then you could be looking at deficit in the third and the fourth quarter as well. But what really has worked in nullifying this is that even as Saudi Arabia and OPEC and allies are looking at these output cuts, but some countries like Russia, Nigeria and Angola will actually be increasing production. And UAE actually is looking to increase production to 3.22 million barrels per day. So we are actually looking at this adjustment of quotas that OPEC and allies have done and is the reason you haven't seen 80 come back in your screens already. Now with nearly 3 million barrels per day of a deficit that the markets are looking at for the month of July is going to be quite positive. But going forward, ahead of that, if, uh, as uh, Saudi Arabia has said, that if the prices continue to see further decline or if the demand does not pick up, then they would be looking at further output cuts beyond July as well. Market also will watch out for the Chinese demand coming back. If that happens, then you could be looking at crude prices seeing some support. But at this point in time, clearly, all eyes on the US Fed meeting, which is on 13th and 14th of June there. Prices could gain up by nearly between $1 to $6 a barrel, is what uh, Goldman Sachs also says only if the Chinese demand comes back. So from here, it not, it's not a sell call. There definitely is a support that has come in for the crude oil price. It 70 to $72 per barrel is a strong support on the lower side. Upside clearly depends on the kind of demand that we will see for C going forward. Thank you for that. With that, it's a wrap in this edition of Markets Today. Thank you for watching.